<laughs> Make it a full, a viewer interactive. Viewers love. You love guys don't have the latest book? My latest I do. Book. I think when we had uh, planned to move a couple of years ago and I had everything packed up. And I think it's one thing that I still haven't got out of, which is the, the, which one is it? It's the uh, new Atkins for the new no, year. Actually, it's at, uh, Eat Right, Not Less. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. We're, we we're on. Okay. All right. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, so I'm Councilman Dave DeMott, my wife, Vanessa DeMott, and then we have a special guest, Colette Heimowitz, with us. Um, and so Colette works with the Atkins Diet Company, and she's an author and nutrition, nutritionist, excuse me, I can't talk today, been one of those days. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people know that I've been on kind of this this journey besides once I got into politics and honestly that's kind of what started it I, I you know took me four years to get elected because that's what happens with everybody um, yes. I actually I was I the first time I ran I was still at Atkins and I went through three companies before I actually got elected um, <laughs> but when I had first got elected I, I had got pretty heavy and wasn't really taking good care of myself I was always a big guy and worked for a multitude of diet companies and I remember Colette you gave me a little bit of a time like you you could do this like I, we had multiple conversations when I worked there about it and I finally decided you know what I'm, I'm going to try it and I actually started trying it on my own because I had tried it a little bit when I worked there and then I was like oh I really started seeing success and I think that's when I kind of reached out to you and said hey you know what what gets me to the next level what am I not you know what am I not doing like I, I knew enough about it right working there for eight years um, and and since then kind of why I was really interested in bringing you on. We often have like political figures and, and stuff on this um, podcast, but I thought that it would be nice to talk to people about, you know, just controlling your health and well-being. And it's been made a big change for me. And it's actually kind of started in my little circle of people that I'm friends with. There's other people who started doing it. And it's funny how like one after another, like, well, how did you do that exactly? Yeah. And then they try it. And then they have a couple of friends who do the same thing. And then we find the products are sold out in every store that we used to go to. <laughs> yeah. We've got everybody well, started on low carb. <laughs> that's, that's true. Then people are like, where did you get that? Next thing I know, I can't find the things I want to buy. But, um, you know, so, so with that, like, I think it's really interesting with uh, the, the keto craze. And it, it, one of the funniest things that has been said to me since I've started this is, I can't do, do Atkins, it's too hard, I do keto. And I just laugh because I'm like, the, Atkins is the original keto. Like it's yeah. every, you know, I remember even at Atkins when we would have our town halls and talking about like South Beach and stuff. And they really were, a lot of them are, you know, not to call them out if it works for people, great. But you know, they're really offshoots, I guess I'll call them instead of calling them ripoffs to be nice. Copycats. But, <laughs> but maybe like that, that's a good starting place. Like maybe, you know, tell us like, well, first of all, give us some background on yourself and how you got into this. Cause I know, you know, this is a, a passion of yours. You, you know, this isn't just a job for you and it's very personal. And I think you have a great story. So maybe start with sharing that for, for folks. Yeah, for sure. Um, my undergraduate work was in theater arts and directing. I used to direct children's theater company on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I would like to take the inner city kids and do uh, children's plays. We created our own plays and we, we took the shows around to uh, Lincoln Center Outdoor Stage. And it took, to this day, they still keep in touch with me. It took them off the streets, kept them away from drugs, made them confident and creative. And I thought that would be my career. And then the funding for the arts was cut off. I used to have to write proposals and get funding uh, to direct, you know, in settlement houses when th those were around. I'm aging myself, I know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I was growing up, we used to have settlement houses in the neighborhood. And there used to be stages there. And then they cut all that funding out. Um, so it was hard for me to make a living. And then my mom got diabetes and heart disease and she died suddenly and we were really close. And I was curious to know, how, how did that happen? You know, we were Italian. We ate a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of pasta and high fat on top of that. Um, Italian bread, you name it. And she was overweight and she had diabetes and heart disease and she died suddenly. And I was just curious. And I used to read nutrition books like novels and then my husband said, well, why don't you go to school and study for that? You're so interested in it. And I used to just naturally help people. You know what I found out? You know, if your blood sugar is chronically high, then it messes up your brain. It messes up 
you have inflammation in your body, it just raises your risk for heart disease. And then when you have diabetes, you know, it's like I used to talk to all my friends about it and they would come to me and I'd try to help me. And then I went back to school. I went for my master's degree at Hunter College to study nutrition. Uh, and I became very passionate about it because it's a science that's always growing. And it's a science that opens up new avenues of thought and consideration. And it continues to grow as time goes on. And since we discovered, I discovered in private practice, um, once I got my master's, I started working in doctor's offices and writing nutrition programs for doctors to hand out to patients. And what I found in clinical practice is I was forced to go low carb because that was the only way we can get the clinical results in patients who were obese and pre-diabetic and you can't do low fat and lose weight and correct blood sugar. And I'll explain that a little bit if you want later. So I was forced to go lower and lower and lower in carbs in each practice that I practiced in. And then I finally went to Dr. Atkins and I said, well, how low could I go? I mean, without risking my, the health of my patients. And he said, well, you know what, why don't you come work for me and I'll show you how long you can go. <laughs> and that's how I started working for Dr. Atkins in his private practice in Manhattan. I directed his nutrition department. And the first thing I did was look at, did a retrospective study. <clears throat> so I looked at all of his charts of thousands of patients, all handwritten at the time. There were no oh, electronic wow. charts. <laughs> so... We did a retrospective study and I found 70 year old women with HDLs of 70. Now I couldn't, wow. I couldn't get an athlete to have an HDL, good cholesterol like that. All of their lipid profiles were good. Nobody had heart disease, nobody had diabetes. And then I went to him and it's like, you know, this is crazy. There's not enough research in this area. Very little at the time, this was 30 years ago. And I said, why don't we fund some research and get some things published? Because there's something really very powerful here. So, and his attitude was, just bring them to the center. He wanted to treat the whole world. <laughs> he wanted them all to go to his center. He wasn't, he wasn't a scientist. He was a clinician, a mm -hmm. cardiologist, brilliant practitioner, but not a researcher. So that's, what, that's when I went to Duke University. And I spoke to, you know, Duke University has a weight loss clinic arm. And I spoke to Dr. Westman at the time, and I told him, here's my retrospective study. Look at the charts. Look at the results. I mean, we need to study this. And so he tried to get money from NIH to, to do a pilot study to show efficacy, because nobody wants to do research until they know it's safe and mm -hmm. it's effective. Yeah. So that first step was really difficult. And I convinced Dr. Atkins to go into his own pocket <laughs> and shell out a million dollars to fund some research pilot studies and then that's when the first once the first pilot study was done 30 years later now we have 130 randomized controlled clinical trials wow. not funded by Atkins all independent funded by the NIH funded by universities hospitals um, independent you know private practices and in every event, it's consistent. Low carbohydrate eating, when it's done correctly, and not when it's done when people are eating salami and cheese all day or mm -hmm. tens of tons of bacon, when it's done correctly, will lower your risk for heart disease, lower your risk for diabetes, help you lose weight, help you maintain that weight loss if you know how to stick to low carb and you find your carbohydrate yep. tolerance. Yep. And never a dull moment. 30 years later, here I am still trying <laughs> to help people write books and, and, uh, and, and try to get the word out there because I think it's really important. Well, I, and so a little, well, first of all, I'm so excited to talk to you about this and I forgot to even <laughs> ask you what you're drinking tonight. So we're, oh, okay. we're, we're, we're drinking a, a diet rum and Coke because yes, that's virtual that cheers. Fits, all right. Fits, you know, I would, I would have, Embarrassed beer lovers and whipped out my low carb beer. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit that I do like on occasion, and so, and my son is a beer connoisseur, and he his eyes roll when I pull out my Heineken light. But um, I didn't bring alcohol tonight. I have 
my guilty pleasure of oh, ice we water. We love we those. Drink, we drink I love these those. things. We love those. Those mix well with rum <laughs> too. Right. <laughs> but you, well, but you you bring up a, a good point with the products that um, there has the beer companies. I mean, a lot of of, of liquor and everybody has really mm -hmm. got on to the to the bandwagon, and we've got a whole discussion planned out to go into the, to those kind of products and food. But you're right; there is there's really no shortage now of hard seltzers, of beers, of of anything to to really go into this lifestyle. So it's really exciting. It really shows thirty years later what this hard work has really done and really put out there for people yeah. and consumers. Well, I think oh. one of the things that you mentioned about uh, your family and diabetes. So my, my dad is diabetic um, and, you know, I'm from an Italian family and that's just, you know, we eat carbs and carbs and bread yeah. and bread. I mean, that's what, yeah. what we and do. Butter. <laughs> and so, you know, and so uh, when I decided to do this, one of the tipping points for me where I was finally was like, I need to do something else besides just, I had gotten, you know, way heavier than I had ever been was my blood work. So I had went and got my blood work. I knew I was coming up to 40 and like, I'm thinking I should probably, you know, redo my life insurance. And then I did my blood work, just, you know, normal routine maintenance. And they told me, oh, well, you're pre-diabetic. And I was like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not going down that path. So, yeah, no, you know, that's when I was like, I need to do something different. And I mean, you've seen my blood work since I started doing it and my, like my blood pressure is perfect. My blood work was perfect. Um, you know, it's a struggle sometimes, you know, especially this COVID thing has got my diet doing a little bit of this, but, mm -hmm. you know, but it really, for me, it's not even a diet though. And I, I kind of actually, I'm like, when people say diet, I'm like, it's really not a diet for me. Like I eat like low carb more than I don't, you know, we have our weeks where we, you know, probably don't behave the way we should, but, um, but I noticed though too, like, I don't feel right. Like I feel off when I eat a bunch of carbs and sugar because I've gotten to the point where my, my body knows what it wants and it performs better that way. And so I think yeah. it's really interesting, you know, that you brought up, you know, that history in your family, because that's kind of parallels my story, why I thought I wanted to do something different. And, and I frankly, I'm still, even though I knew it, it would work, I am still amazed with the results that I was able to get with it. And I'm sure that's the story of a lot of people. Yeah. Sure. It changes lives. And you know, the interesting thing, David, they did, there's one research study that shows that people who have been following low carbohydrate for an extended period of time, like up to six months, when they do go off the diet, they handle carbohydrates better because the body has cleared out the excess insulin and excess sugar. So that little mm -hmm. bit of insult every once in a while, the triglycerides don't spike up as high. So they, mm -hmm. they took people that, that were on low carb that had a history of high triglycerides and they took people that were on a regular diet that had a history of, you know, just eating a mixed diet. And when they carb loaded them on an occasion, their triglycerides didn't spike the way it did in the past. So you have a little bit of grace period for cheating and what you <laughs> yeah. do for 99% of the time is what really counts. But eventually, if you, that constant insult is going to start breaking down the sugar metabolism again, so yeah. that occasional little cheat, you know, little comfort food here and there. Like my cheese is bread still to this day. <laughs> 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 I, I, and it has to be good bread. I won't cheat. And like, I'll take a little bite. It's like, no, I, it's yep. not worth it. You know what I yep. mean? Well, but, so you, Kawhi, you had, you had mentioned with, um, you know, being able to maintain the lifestyle for a certain amount of time, have some of those, um, you know, cheat foods or, or a cheat day, a cheat weekend. Um, much like, you know, we, we've all had here sitting in, in, in quarantine for a couple months. Um, but speaking of quarantine, the whole reason we're here in this place is because of, of a respiratory illness that has yeah. been horrifically affecting our population all over the world. But it affects some people more than others. And so yeah. what we were first seeing, especially in New York, and you're from the East Coast, so what we were first seeing when um, a lot of this information came out was those with diabetes, those that are overweight, those that have mm -hmm. these high risk factors, this respiratory illness is gonna affect them more. Mm -hmm. um, you can support that with what you've seen, but now that we're all being, you know, we're able to come back out, um, what can we do to kind of support and, and kind of get through that? Where's all this research? Great. Yeah, I'm just starting that? to blog about that now. Um, so let's explain why the people that are overweight with diabetes and with heart disease are more likely to be hospitalized 